Okay. Peace and love, Dr. Carmen Johnson. How are you this evening, sis? Hey, Aunt Rhonda. I guess I need to turn my mic off. I mean, my screen <laughs> off. I had a rough day today. Girl, you don't have to have it on. I got my little picture over in the corner, honey. I always have my um lady do rag on and sweatshirt. So you all good. You <laughs> I've you... been up since five o'clock this morning. It, oh, it was man. rough. It was rough. Oof. Oh, oh. Well, good to hear your voice. You too, Aunt Rhonda. <laughs> I was telling the uh, family, I said, I'm going to be respectful tonight. I won't curse out of respect for Sis Carmen. And then um, Sis came in with my niecey poo. <coughs> T. Christopher came in, to me, came in and said, now you know, Dr. Carmen be cussing too. I'm like, I, I was laughing to myself. I'm like, I know, but still. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> Sometimes is no other word to express, you know, what I've been through except through a, a curse word. So yeah. sometimes it's like that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, I do want to walk welcome you aboard and um I could read your bio. I don't think I really have to. Um I would re well, let me read your bio. I'll read your bio to give the family some background and then okay. we'll get into the interview. Um, oh, and um, my niece, Pooh, Tamika is sending you love. She's sending you love. <laughs> She's in a chat. She's in a YouTube chat. Okay, so uh, Dr. Carmen Johnson had created a niche in educating youth and seniors returning citizens and abused women about financial literacy through a wide variety of gr grassroots programs designed to uplift, empower, and destroy the barriers to individual and family prosperity. For Carmen, financial responsibility and good credit are at the root of community and family success. She is still committed to changing the culture of low-income streams and credit unworthiness, particularly among minority populations in urban neighborhoods, often defined by redlining and exorbitant interest rates. She brings a special passion to her work as a mentor, financial counselor, and educator. Johnson is uniquely qualified to teach financial literacy by virtue of her individual success and as one of the few individuals who held separate professional certifications as a certified educator in personal finance, certified consumer debt specialist, and certified residential housing counselor. She also held a, a certificate of achievement as a business financial consultant. From the beginning of 2020 until now, uh, Dr. Carmen has been working with Life After Release after her own unexpected wrongfully con conviction and incarceration. She took a political hit and spent three years in federal prison camp for women in Alderson, West Virginia. When LAR executive director asked Carmen to coordinate LAR's court watch program, Carmen accepted. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Since then, Dr. Carmen is now the director of court watch and judicial accountability and has sat in over 3,200 bond review hearings in the District Court of Prince George County as of today. They now have over 116 court watches along with law students that work under the guidance of Dr. Carmen Johnson. So I want uh, to welcome Sis Carmen to uh, the platform today to um, share with us her plight 
Um, so before we get started, sis, did you have anything you want to share? Because uh, I want this to be as impromptu as possible. Um, or we can get right into uh, the questions we outlined. Uh-oh, you got muted. <clears throat> All right, so I'm, I'm here. Okay. How's everybody doing? I am certainly pleased to be here, and I'm excited to be on, uh, on uh, your platform. And um, I'm looking forward to an inter interesting evening. And you must forgive me. I've been up since 5 this morning. I'm very tired. That's so okay. So I may be... Uh, <sighs> dragging in my words, but I'm high in spirits. So. All right. No worries. No worries. I understand. So we're going to um, jump into the questioning. So, and you have to excuse me. <clears throat> my allergies would be acting up, child. It's been a tripped out couple of days for, for me as well. Uh, so can you tell us about the company that you had that was helping uh, melanated people with finances, credit, and home ownership? Um, the name of my uh, for-profit company back then was Able Estate and Company, and we offered the services of credit restoration, debt arbitration, financial planning, preparation for bankruptcy, rehabilitation after bankruptcy, identity fraud services, household budgeting. Uh, we also uh, paid people's uh, debts off and um, it was considered as a, uh, a personal loan and we was able to report that personal loan uh, to the credit agencies. We was a member of Equifax, TransUnion and Experian. And so uh, we served well over 5,000 uh, uh, families um, around actually the United States. Okay. Wow, what, what, what led you into that line of work? Well, from the time that I was little, my grandmother who uh, was Cherokee Indian, um, she, uh, started teaching my brother and I about um, financial literacy. We didn't know that that's what it was called back then. Um, you know, we was uh, three and four years old and wow. you know, we had our own little bank account and um, we would uh, sit at the, the dining room table when she would, you know, put her, um, when she would pay her bills and mm -hmm. we would um, lick the, the stamps on the envelope and, um, you know, and things of that nature. And she just taught us at a very young age about saving money and that the only thing that we had was our name and, and our uh, straight finances. So wow. It was my grandma that started that. Wow. So, That's impressive. That is very, very impressive. Can you kind of tell us what led to you being investigated for mortgage banking and wire fraud? Well, when the feds uh, first came, I was not aware that that's what the, the issue was. Mm -hmm. I was not aware of that because I was not into real estate. Um, I was not into mortgages. Uh, my uh, company, my for-profit or my nonprofit did not offer any of those type of services. Um, so when they first raided me, um, to my understanding, it was a, a, a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, you know, stated that, you know, no statutes, codes, or laws were broken. They, you know, they went through all of my uh, finances and things of that nature. And um, they couldn't find anything because I knew that I, I had not done anything wrong. Subjectively, they mm -hmm. kept a very large sum of money that they had uh, seized from my um, business bank accounts. And um, it was okay until I started asking for the money back. 
Whoa. Right around that same time is when I became the, the housing chair for Prince George's County in AACP. And at that time, I was still asking for my money back. Look, give me my money back. If, you know, if I've done nothing wrong, give me my money back. And, um, and then after that, I became the housing chair for the state conference um, NAACP of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that's when I uh, got into the um, trying to stop the illegal foreclosures mm -hmm. that was going on in the black, brown and tan communities in, uh, in Maryland. And um, some very uh, powerful people um, wanted me to stop that narrative, and I refused. Wow. Now, <clears throat> I've talked about this before um, on this platform several times, and I've done um, a podcast. I actually have a, a series of regarding the economy, and I specifically speak on housing and I kind of gave a rundown of the whole 2008 crisis, uh, the housing crisis, how it got to that point and how it literally bankrupted the world. And mm -hmm. the bad part about that, people lost their shirt. Of course, I know you know it a lot deeper than I do. Um, Millions of people lost their homes, yada, yada, yada. The plus side for me, it woke me up like that. Because all I kept thinking in my head was, why should they bail out the banks with taxpayer money and not pay everybody's mortgages off and set a clean playing field. So that sparked me to kind of go behind the curtains and do all of this research. And then I found out about um, the robo signing. Um, I know you know what I'm talking about when I say that, the robo signing and, and the, uh, the predatory lending. I guess my question to you do you think because you were advocating about the illegal foreclosures going on in high numbers in the black and brown communities that it pissed off that particular industry of good old boys club with the banking folk, if that makes sense? Um, absolutely, but it started actually, it started with my nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, which um, in my nonprofit, which was uh, called the Katie Abel Foundation, which was named after my grandmother. Mm. And um, so we taught financial literacy from uh, elementary school on up. Oh, wow. And we went into the public schools and the private schools and also into some of the colleges teaching the true financial literacy. Wow. And um, with that being said, um, before the housing piece, it was the Wall Street, the bailout of Wall Street. So I took a, a bunch of youth uh, 12th graders to New York. And um, we made a documentary. I mean, it took us a couple of months to make the documentary, but we went to, to New York trying to uh, interview the protesters on um, how they felt about, at that time, in the beginning stages of the documentary, mm -hmm. of the documentary, that, you know, the feds were thinking about bailing the uh, Wall Street out. And then, of course, that ended up happening. Mm -hmm. Now, let's let's be clear when that happened, when the fail of Wall Street happened, so many senior citizens and, and you know, older people, they lost their retirement. People forgot about that. Mm -hmm. that. And so of course, Wall Street got bailed out. And so right after that, then that's when the, um, 
the housing uh, market started uh, uh, changing. Um, so it started with me speaking out about how that was so wrong for them to mm. bail out Wall Street when here it is, we are, you know, taxpayers. Yep. And, um, and so many senior citizens lost all of their their money and um and then next thing i know then then the housing market hit you know with the illegal foreclosures and 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 the subprime mortgages and all of that crazy creative mortgages and all mm -hmm. of that next thing you know the 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 banks got bailed out so now here it is we standing here the seniors, the seniors, they didn't lost their retirement, and, and then now they didn't lost their retirement and their homes, and then you know, young families lost their homes. I mean, it was just a disaster. Right. And let's keep in mind when you think back, who who was uh, who was the president then? Think about it. You tell me who the president was then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now, now that even makes more sense. So you had been on the radar. Wasn't right. that uh, called Occupy Wall Street or am I not remembering right? Was was that what that movement was called? Exactly. Back okay, Occupy Wall Street. So you had started, um, yeah. you got on the radar back then. Okay. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And and for the sake of, of the family, I know I've talked about this several times, but you are the expert. If you can put in layman terms for the family, how the housing market actually crashed. What did they actually do from a finance perspective to cause that tidal wave? Well, I, I only can put it in my perspective because I wasn't in the mortgage industry. I wasn't in the real estate industry. What I can say to you, you guys, all of you, is that when I first started my for-profit company, Able Estate and Company, you had to have scores like 750, 800 in order to get a, a mortgage loan. You had to show, you know, months of pay stubs and you had to show tax returns, mm -hmm. two and three years of tax returns. And you had to show this and you had to show that and all of, all of this stuff that you had to show. And, and I, I think I started that company in like 1998 or something like that. Okay. And so, again, you had to have high scores and you had to produce all of this documentation. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, they started coming up with the, these creative mortgages. And as time went on, mortgage companies and realtors around the United States started hearing about my services. Mm. And so they started referring um, their clients to me for credit services and debt services or my company paying off all of their, their debts. And, um, and of course, you know, we, we, we get, we would get paid at closing. Mm -hmm. And around that time, the, um, the equity in the homes was rising really fast. Mm -hmm. But the requirements to get the, the house was going down. So people started refinancing like every couple of months and all kinds of stuff like that. It got to the point, it got so bad, you could have a score of 450. And one, maybe two pay stubs, if that, and a heartbeat. That's all you needed. And so a lot of 
of these black and brown and tan families did not need to be in those creative mortgages and mm -hmm. tailored mortgages and fraud mortgages that was being produced. A lot of the families had 800 scores, wow. but was put into subprime mortgages. Whoa, wait, wait a minute, sis Carmen. Ciao. Yeah. It was real bad. That I did not know. I assumed. Mm -mm. And shame on me. It could have been what I heard the media say. And shame on me for believing them. That they were in the category of the um, subprime lender. Because that's the term they were they're using. Some subprime loans uh, because of their credit scores. So what you're saying is that that was not the case that they did have the proper credit score. And we're, of course, we're not saying all, okay? So don't nobody come on my threads talking about some all. We're not saying all. But what you're saying is there were uh, a lot of folks that did fit the requirements, the 750 credit score and up, but they were put in these messed up loans Exactly. Exactly. And again, around that time, the equity was going up, 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 up so fast. And then it was also situations where, you know, clients was coming to my office and they was referred by the banks, the five major banks or mortgage companies or realtors. And, you know, everyone that came into my office had to go through a household budget and things of that nature. You, we, they had to go through a vetting process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I told some of the, the realtors and, and mortgage companies and banks, this person cannot afford this wow. house. And um, it got to a point where at first the, the realtors, the 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 banks, the mortgage companies, they would take my advice. Mm -hmm. But it got to a point when they did not, because at that time, they had something called stated. All you had to do was say, hey, you know, I've been on my job this long, or I, I don't know what stated entailed, but mm -hmm. they could just say what it was. Or I made this amount of money and, and they didn't have to show proof. And I would tell the the realtors and the you know and the financial institutes that they can't afford this house, and wow. they would literally they started telling me you need to mind your business. You know we sending you business. You just need to you know do whatever you need to do and mind your business. You know is and and they were it was true. When a client left my office, it is it wasn't my business. Right. However. For me, I took each person that walked through through that door, through my office door, I took it very personable because my name, I grew up on your name is everything. That's right. And your integrity is everything. And um, so it got to a point where they wasn't listening to me. Wow. It didn't matter what I said because it was so many different, I guess they called it mortgage products that was out there. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. And then the boom came. Right. So based on all of what you're telling us, it appears, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I by no means want to put words in your mouth. That's why you were really targeted because you were exposing the fraud in the system. Well, they understood. They understood like I was like, the, my only other competition, my only mm -hmm. competition was Susie Ormond. You know what I mean? Who um, is backed by TransUnion. I don't know if she's still around. And but, my lips are cursed. You can't see if they perched to the side, but okay. <laughs> she, 
she was my only competition. So here it is. She's, you know, Caucasian and, and, you know, and I'm, you know, native. So, right. Uh, she was mom. I was speaking out. I was, you know, I created a documentary and the matter of fact, the documentary won an award. So I was speaking out oh, about, wow. and then I started speaking out about the, 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 the housing crisis. Wow. And then I started getting families their homes back by contacting the presidents and the vice presidents of those banks and of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the judges, calling the judges chambers. Hey, you're getting ready to auction off a house and uh, that's a illegal foreclosure and these are the facts. The wow. promissory note is in a bundle number, blah, 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 being traded on Wall Street right now. So there is no wet ink promissory note. Now, <clears throat> that's the part that the average person to this day still does not understand what happened with that entire um, housing crisis because they were... What's the term they used when they were betting on the loans? Uh, there's, dang, I can't think of that term. It'll come to me. But what most people don't know is that all of those loans that they were selling, they were packaging them up, as you mm -hmm. stated, selling mm -hmm. them, wait, stamping. <clears throat> yeah, this is my stamp. Stamping them. The credit rating agencies were stamping them as A-rated loans. Yep. When yep. in fact, you had predatory loans built in there and mm -hmm. they were being packaged up and sold to Wall Street. I know for a fact, some people have told me that they had uh, like second mortgages second and third mortgages on their property because like you said the the housing prices were like going through the roof and <clears throat> when the crash happened it was so bad the paperwork was so shoddy so mm -hmm. bad that they didn't even know who to send their payments to mm -hmm. yeah so can I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. They, they used to try to sucker you into those loans. They always used to do that. I'm sure Dr. Carmen uh, Johnson, remember the people, they gave them those, those really like 4% and all that kind of stuff, interest and variables and all that kind of stuff. But they always tried to sucker people into those things. And you didn't have to have proof of anything. Nope. Nothing. You didn't have to have proof of working. Yeah. And you didn't have to have proof of income. Nothing. Nope. So, <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, that's Cisantra. Uh, so, <clears throat> based on all of this, which is just incredible within itself what led up to your arrest the trial and then the ultimate conviction well i don't want to go into too many details oh of course of as, course as you know i got a, a book getting ready to drop in the next supposed to be by uh, September um, is dropping, um, but some very uh, uh, powerful, you know, Caucasians was uh, trying to force me to change the narrative. And at that particular time, I was going all over the news on different news stations um, talking about the fact that we needed a moratorium to freeze the illegal foreclosures that Whoa. was happening in the state of Maryland. And um, I even was, 
you know, offered a bag. And there was no way that I could sell my people out. Wow. I was offered, you know, or made uh, uh, the, the su- I was given the suggestion several times, what do I want to stop the narrative? And um, and I said, I wanted my uh, people to uh, to be able to stay in their homes. Not to mention there were families and in Prince George's County, I'm not sure where you guys um, are from, uh, but in Prince George's County, Maryland, they have some of the most beautiful, big, huge homes. Everyone thinks about Atlanta mm-hmm. um, with the big, beautiful homes, but these were big, beautiful, gorgeous homes. Wow. That was uh, potentially owned by um, people of color. And their wealth, their generational wealth was stolen from them. And um, there were actually families that was living in the woods. And wow. for me, the house thing never was, was never my cup of tea mm-hmm. unless you pay for it in cash. And that's how my grandmother taught me. Um, so that was never my thing. But what was most important to me was the fact that they was destroying black and brown and tan families. Mm-hmm. That's the part that blew my mind. Wow. And um, as we've, you know, growing up, we've heard the stories of how, you know, black men don't marry black women. Brown men don't marry brown women. Tan men don't marry tan women. They just make babies with them. Well, mm-hmm. these were husbands and wives and children. Wow. So basically generational wealth disappearing. Exactly. Snatched from them, basically. Stolen right from under them. Yep. So... What were you officially convicted of and what was the subsequent sentencing? Um, I Wrong, f- wrongfully. Uh, I apologize. Let me put that wrongfully up in there. I apologize. I would say fraudulently. Fraudulently. Okay. That's what I would say. That's what I do say because that's emphatically what it was and then I was ultimately sold into involuntary servitude Mm -hmm. but um when they first started coming after me um because I wouldn't I would not stop going on the news I would not change the Mm -hmm. narrative uh they uh offered me a plea for 30 years and they kept asking me what did I do and I didn't understand what they were asking me because I hadn't done anything. Like I didn't know what they were talking about, but yet subjectively they wanted me to take a 30 year plea. And so of course I wasn't going to do anything like that. Uh, you know, it, it, that didn't make sense. And as a, a practice in Buddhist, it was just no way that I could lie on myself and say I did something nor could I operate through the lenses of, uh, of, um, of fear. Right. And um, so I'm like, y'all tell me what did I do? So we all looking at each other, they, they t- like, you know, you tell me what I did. If I did something, tell me what I did. So then they, they couldn't get me on that. And <laughs> so then another year went by. And I'm still, you know, on the pavement fighting to get these families, you know, homes back or, you know, fighting to uh, keep them in their homes. And then, you know, I, you know, conducted a huge march on Annapolis, Maryland. Mm. And, um, you know, it was just a beautiful sight to see. Um, 
um, you know, me, me telling people to, you know, stand up for yourselves with them not knowing that I was being followed by the feds. I was mm. being followed by the bank investigators. Mm -hmm. I was being taunted and I lived alone. And um, they was coming in and out of my home and uh, they was calling me in my office and they was calling me the N word as they called me on the phone. And, you know, I would watch them. I would stand at my window in the dark and watch white men run in and out of my, my yard. Wow. And, um, you know, they tried to run me off the road a couple of times and it was just, you know, I kept asking the NAACP for bodyguards. I'm like, look, I, I, I you know, I need help. You know, they are following me. They are, you know, coming after me. They're doing this, they're doing that. Not knowing that they had their own initiatives going on behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. The NAACP. What? Um, this, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't want to break your train of thought. Uh, the second plea was for, I don't know, I can't remember what the second plea was. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm like, I, I know it was less than the 30 years. Okay. I, I'm like, I'm not even, I'm not even doing that. Not to mention, I went through four different attorneys, by the way, just to let you guys know that. Um, four different high profile attorneys, to be exact. Um, and then finally, they charged me in 2014, the third raid, they came to my home. Mm -hmm. And um, they had guns to my head. I opened up the door, my, my dumb butt. I don't know. I never went through this before. I opened up the door. People was like, well, you shouldn't open the door. I, I don't know. It, right. Ain't no, handbook, ain't no handbook on this. Right. So, right. <laughs> I opened up the door 20, 20 something white man came through the door who, you know, threw me up against the wall and all kinds of stuff. And you don't want to cooperate. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've been cooperating with you guys for the last few years. What are you talking about? And um, they arrested me at that time. And I was arrested for like four hours, detained. And that's when I found out about these houses and the, the attorney that I had at the time, he was like, you know anything about these, these properties? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about this. And so of course, you know, I pled not guilty because I didn't know anything about it. I, could, I didn't understand what the heck was going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, as time moved on, that's when um, I found out that it was, um, 14 Tanzanian Africans mm -hmm. and 12 of them I did not know okay. and two of them I, I did know of. We did business in 2007, 2008 and it was no big deal. I mean, I did business with realtors as far as them sending clients to my office. Mm -hmm or them sending documentation to my office pertaining to credit. Um, the same thing with banks all around the United States, mortgage companies, but I never dealt with houses. I never dealt with mortgages. I never dealt with any of that. It was strictly the, the credit, the debt, um, that aspect of it. And, um, so as time went on, of course, uh, the third plea was for 10 and a half years. And mm. they uh, charged me with 24 counts of mortgage bank wire fraud, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and uh, false statements on loan applications. Well, <laughs> all of that was far from the truth. Right. As far as I'm concerned, from my standpoint, um, from my services. And um, 
the all 14 of the Africans took a plea mm -hmm. and I was the only one that went to trial. Mm -hmm. And um, of course I had a blue ribbon jury. They was not of my peers. They knew nothing about uh, credit. They knew nothing about the services that I offered. Mm -hmm. um, I was told by the judge that I could not talk about my humanitarian work. I couldn't talk about my activist work. I couldn't talk about um, my nonprofit. I couldn't talk about being the housing chair for the state conference in AACP of Maryland. I couldn't wow. talk about uh, any of that stuff. So mm -hmm. they pretty much stripped me of who I was mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that was left was the lie, their lies. And Winston Churchill, I'm always quoting him, once said, the most precious thing is the truth, but right. almost always the truth is barricaded beneath lies. Yep. So the only thing that was left was the lies. And wow. um, subjectively, the, the two head Africans, the two mm -hmm. head realtors, they both got on the stand and they both said she didn't know about our scam, nor did she financially benefit, nor mm -hmm. is she part of our community. And then one of them said, well, she did work on our client's credit. Well, I was licensed by the state of Maryland. I right. was registered with the Better Business Bureau. I had an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Never mm -hmm. had a complaint by any client ever. Right. Um, I did ethical business in the community and around the nation. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, oh, and the, he, they both said that I didn't know about their scam, nor did I financially benefit. Mm-hmm. I'm not part of their community. And one of them said, well, she worked on our client's credit. And the other one said, well, she knew we were realtors. Well, I worked with realtors around the United States. Exactly. And? Exactly. So the trial should have stopped. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it did not. Wow. And um, people that supposed to have been coming to speak in my defense, mm -hmm. supposed to have been coming that next week they stopped the trial earlier than, than what was anticipated. So the people that I had come in to speak in my defense the following week, it didn't happen. Wow. Um, wow. I, was, I was found guilty on all 24 counts. Um, and as I sat through that trial, looking at all the documentation, not even knowing what the heck I was looking at. And then they would like do stuff like they would they would intertwine my bank uh, statements in, 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 in between the documents, which my bank statements had nothing to do with right. what was happening. And they would, they would keep, they kept flashing like my ID or something like that. Like they had to create something with that was connected to me, even though what they were showing had nothing to do with the fraud or the scheme or whatever was happening. It was those 14 people. Right. Um, however, you know, they stopped the trial. They went into deliberation. It took them less than an hour and a half to find me guilty on all 24 counts. Um, I was arrested immediately. I never went back home. Um, the, the prosecutor said that I was a terrorist. I was ISIS. Um, I was a danger to the community. What do ISIS have to do with that? I mean, I'm not even ISIS, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I come in peace. Like, you know, like to be accused of those things. And I'm thinking right. to myself, they're going to send me to what they call that place, Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God. and they arrested me immediately. Wow. And, and I never went back home for three years and some months. So did they ever give a reason for like abruptly 
uh, stopping the trial per se and earlier than was scheduled? Did they even give a reason or it's like, okay, well, we're going to deliberate tomorrow. We're going to deliberate today is what they said. Whoa. As you were going through the trial, who were your advocates? Who was advocating on your behalf? No one. And I was, I was still taking phone calls. This is how selfless I am. And as a Buddhist and a scholar of metaphysics, science of the mind and mental science, you know, I'm selfless. I am everyone and everyone is me. And when I look back, I maybe I should have been on the news talking about what they was trying to do to me. Maybe I should have changed the narrative and said, hey, this is what they're trying to do to me. Mm -hmm. Because I had the platform, I had the voice. Okay. Um, however, I didn't really get into details with people about what, what I was going through and what stage I was in. Mm -hmm. However, I kept telling the NAACP, however, I need wow. audience. I need help. They are trying to kill me. They are trying to do this. They are trying to do that. And they turned their backs on me. Wow. So injustice happened in an empty courtroom. And and I, I'm going to guess no, but I need to hear it from you. And I think about it. Yeah. Injustice, injustice yeah. happened in an empty courtroom. Yeah. So so no publicity, none of that. Nope. How were you feeling at the time of this fraudulent sentencing? You don't have to share it if if you don't want to. No, I'm, 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 no, that's, that's not it. Well, the sentencing happened four and a half months later. And um, I was, uh, when they, cause they arrested me immediately. So I wasn't given the benevolence to go home and handle my affairs. So mm -hmm. I wasn't given the benevolence to, to close my house down, to close my for-profit business down, to close my nonprofit business down. I wasn't given the benevolence to handle any of my affairs. And I am the, type of lady that I like nice things and I like things to smell good and I like things to you know I just like pretty things right and especially as a Buddhist I love red and you know and golds and earth tones and mm -hmm. and I'm making a point I'm there's a reason why I'm saying this mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that first when they arrested me immediately they they moved me from Maryland into Washington, D.C. They took me to D.C. jail and they threw me in a, a little cell with fecal matter all over the walls and floors in the door and the stench of urine and um, not even being mentally prepared. Hey, I know that I got sentencing in four or five months and I got to get my affairs in order. No, they arrested me immediately and threw me in that type of environment. And it absolutely blew my mind. Wow. Into 1,000 pieces. And um, I had to sit in that, in solitary confinement for about eight and a half days or something. And it was, I, I still can hear the women beating on the walls and the doors and the screams and the hollering. And I lived alone for years, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm used to, you know, going home to quiet, right. you know? 
and I can still hear them today. Their screams and hollers. And um, it was just a horrible yeah. thing. But the um, the eight eight days later, the psychiatrist came to interview me. And um, at first, he never looked at me. So he was asking all these regular generic questions. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I assumed the way that I was speaking and the way that I was answering him. And it, at that time, he had not looked at me. I was just another number. And finally, he put his ink pen down and he looked up at me. And he said, who are you? And then I gave him the little whatever the little jail number is, whatever ID number. Mm -hmm. He said, no, who are you out there? Mm -hmm. And um, and then I said, I'm Dr. Carmen Johnson. I am the housing chair for the state conference in NAACP and I've been politically hit. Mm -hmm. And um, so he Googled me. And so a couple of news um, interviews came up because, you know, I could hear him, hear the news thing talking. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so he turned back around and he looked at me and he said, um, he held up a piece of paper mm -hmm. and he said, you've been um, court ordered to stay in that cell, solitary confinement in that particular cell with the human fecal matter everywhere. Um, he didn't say the human fecal matter right. everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm just make, giving you a visual. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it, for the next four and a half months until sentencing. And I just broke down and just cried because not to mention my judge went to Morehouse. <clears throat> um, and um, which means that my judge was a man of color. Okay. I... I, I assume that, but thank you. Mm -hmm. And for him to do something like that to me, it, I was, I, it just broke my heart. And um, so anyway, the doctor said, um, you're never going to see me again. Um, I'm going to release you into general population and I need you to fight to get out of here. And he said, and they are going to fire me. And of course, I never saw him again. Wow. And he did release me into general population. Wow. Um, yeah. Ooh, that That's powerful. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if you can, and, and it's okay if you don't want to uh, talk about kind of your experience, because... You were in, was it called like, it was called a prison work camp? Is that correct? I was at um, Alderson Federal Prison Camp, Federal Prison Camp for Women. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you kind of tell us what type of women were at the prison work camp far as um, what were their particular convictions? Um, it was mostly Caucasian women, and it was probably about a hundred and something of us um, women of color. Okay. You know. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, a lot of them were there for drugs. And, um, and white collar. Uh crimes okay what what was the environment at at that uh prison work camp what was that environment like well it was racist so i was at the same camp that martha stewart was at oh, same camp okay that, yeah the same camp that billy holiday was at oh so when you see the lady sings the blues, yeah, very Austin. familiar. Yes, 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 yes. She's in that padded room mm -hmm. and going through withdrawals. Uh, she was at Alderson. She wow. wasn't at this, 
she wasn't walking around with no robe on and sunshades like they had Diana Ross doing. Mm -mm, that's not, that's not, that's not, mm -mm. she actually in, in uh, her uh, books, she, one, one of her autobiographies, uh, she said that that was the most racist place that she had ever experienced in her life. And um, she became a advocate for racism until she died. Uh, they don't tell that piece mm -hmm. about her. Um, but it was as of 2015, it was racist. Let me say I left in 2018. So from 2015 to 2018, they, they were still racist. Um, wow. However, when I first got there, I do not remember how I got there. I did not remember my name. I did not know why I was there. I did not remember being a Buddhist. Um, I remember being a Christian because I grew up on Pentecostal mm -hmm. in Christianity, number one. And number two, I remembered, and I'm not going to cry. Um, I remember the the native things that my grandmother taught me about the ancestors and certain things to do and stuff like that. I remembered that, and I remember being a Christian, but I did not remember anything about being an activist at that time. I did not remember being a Buddhist. I did not remember being a scholar of metaphysics, but I remember being a Christian and being, uh, saying the words, you know, the blood of Jesus and, you know, protect me and doing my little native chants to uh, call on the ancestors. Those were the two things that I, I knew to do. Gotcha. And um, talking about going back to your roots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, I know that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what led to to your release? Um, and I know I and I can't wait for your book to come out. I will be snagging a copy. I will be promoting it and reading it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I know you're going to give a lot more details in the book about that experience and that um, prison work camp. Um, but if you can kind of give us a high level of what led to your release. Um, actually, it was two congressmen and a senator. Um, I, and I, you know, at that point, because I had went cuckoo, you know, per se, or, you know, lost my memory extensively, my short term, my long term, all of that. Um, well, actually, when I was at D.C. jail, my sisters had to come up and um, I had to sign over everything to to them to handle my affairs. Okay. So they fired the other attorneys and all of that kind of stuff and uh, got some Florida attorneys. And um, so when, when I, after a year of me being there, so in 2015, 2016, that's when I remembered I was Buddhist. That's when I remembered, hey, I'm an activist. That's when I remember, I started remembering all of these things little by little okay. about who I was. So by that, by 12 months, I pretty much had got back to normal per se. And I was mm -hmm. just in a shock of the conditions that I saw the women was in. And, and even, you know, not having no mental health treatment and, and little medical care and things of that nature and uh, going all the way to the Supreme Court in 2017 and losing and being frustrated with all of that and being physically abused by the guards and and all of those things and those uh, 
two white attorneys telling my sisters, there's nothing we can do. This is what happens when you're in a jail, prison, camp, or cage. And I remember my sister telling me that. And I remember thinking, bullshit. Right. You know, and this was in 2017, by this time, after losing in the Supreme Court. And I said, I, I need you to, 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 to get me out of here. I can't. I can't do anything, you know, symbolically, symbolically, allegorically, they've shaved my head. They fucked out my eyes. I'm Samson. You know, I need you to get mm -hmm. me to the pillars. I need you to get me to the pillars and I need you to follow my instructions. And I'm going to bring, I've got to say a curse word, this Come motherfucker right down. Mm -hmm. I need you to get me to the pillars. And so, and remember, that's the story of Samson. Mm -hmm. And so my sis, my baby sister, because at that point, nobody was was accepting my jail phone calls, mm -hmm. except my little sister, who's nine years younger than me. And she, and I said, I need you to plug in my cell phone and I need you to call these people, which are politicians. I need, I need you to call them. And I need their, their cell phone is in my cell phone. I need you to call them and tell them what's going on, what, what they're doing to me here, you know? And um, I remember my baby sister telling me, and at that time I was hollering and screaming and crying at the phone because mm -hmm. I had just got strangled and drugged on the floor and fainted and it was just a mess. And I remember my, my baby sister telling me, Okay, it's not going to work, but okay. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can still hear those words now. Wow. And um, and so then I called her back like a 30 minutes later or whatever. And she was like, oh my God, Congressman so-and-so said, call him. And I'm like, okay, I got to run down the hill and I got to put his number in and I got to do this and I got to do that. Then I got to wait and blah, 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 and this and that. And um, that's when the ball got started. Gotcha. And um, I was actually sentenced to almost five years and I got out three years and some months. But it breaks my heart because if my sisters had just listened to me sooner, I could have came home sooner. Mm. That's number one. Okay. And number two, when I did come home, that's when I was emphatically sure that this injustice system is a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Because it was no motions filed. It was none of that foul to get me out of there. Wow. Woo. Child. Um, kind of want to change directions. Uh, before I do, um, no, I'm just going to change directions because you've gone in very much so detailed about, um, that experience. I, I kind of want to go in the direction of, of you talking about, um, the current the, the current petition you have um i'll stop there if you kind of want to give the family a little bit of insight of the petition and where they can find the petition um and i'm going to drop it in the chat for the family as well and then um if you are watching youtube i have rotating um uh things coming across the screen and uh, the petition site is there as well. Um, but yeah, uh, sis, if you don't mind kind of telling the family about the current petition out there on change.org. Um, and by the way, that this was the Disney version. <laughs> Woo! Child, you don't know how long when you, if you watch this back, you'll see me with the Kleenex, honey. And, and it it's, it's taken a hell of a lot for me not to break down. So, all right, go. If, if you don't mind talking about the um, change.org uh, petition for the family. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, 
my sister and my computer guy who's been with me, he's like a little brother to me. He's been with me almost 20 years and um, saved all of my things. I thought all my stuff was lost, but he saved all of my, you know, my videos and documentary and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so we uh, created this. Um, I, I, now that I look back and I know so much more now, I wish that it, it the petition was not on change.org because uh, number one, when people make donations, it doesn't go to me, it goes to change.org. Oh, and crap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Uh, second of all, it's been up since September. And um, unfortunately, it's only gotten about 1,200 signatures, if, if that. And um, when I first put it up, um, people at that time, uh, President Trump was in office. Mm -hmm. And um, as you read the, the top of the petition, it says to the president of the United States, it does not say to President Trump. <coughs> yep. So I had a lot of organizations to tell me that they was not going to support my effort unless I put uh, president, president elect or something uh, Biden. And I said, I'm not gonna do that. And um, so they told me that I was a Trump supporter. And I'm like, well, how can I be a Trump supporter? Tr Trump's name is not listed anywhere on my petition. It's saying to the president of the United States, to the chief and commanding officer, based on articles two to grant me a full pardon, but most importantly, to investigate what the Department of Justice in the state of Maryland did to me. Mm -hmm. And- um, Wow. I had, I had a lot of people that looked like me that say that they wasn't going to support it. And um, so I have not, gotten a lot of support but I can't let that I can't let that that's their that's their right problem. absolutely absolutely um, and then I've had some people say oh you need to take it down it's so embarrassing you don't have that many signatures I don't care about that either I don't have ego exactly. so I, I don't care about that either it's going to stay right there and um this petition is not about me. If they were of any type of intellect or, or any intelligence, they would understand that this petition is about all of us. Because one of the biggest things that I, I speak out about is the fact that the feds have a 98% conviction rate. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they have this 98% rate is because people that look like me and look like you yeah. are taking pleas. Yep. They, they're taking pleas for things they did not do. They're taking pleas for football numbers for the stupidest stuff. Right. Right. And, it's, and, and you know, I don't know if you heard of Khalif Broder, the little backpack kid from New York. Um, he was 16 years old, and I had never heard of his story until 2019 when, mm -hmm. you know, I came home in 2018. So in 2019, I saw the documentary that was uh, created by, I think, Jay-Z and I think Rosie O'Donnell was part mm -hmm. of it or something like that. And um, he was 16 and they was trying to get him to say he stole this kid's backpack. And mm -hmm. he said that he did not do it. And so they threw him in Rankers Island. And that is probably one of the, the worst. worst. Exactly. And he kept saying, why do I have to take a plea for something I didn't do? And at that particular time, I didn't know how that that documentary was going to end. But what I can tell you is that I had about 10 or 20 uh, ways on how I was gonna kill myself. Mm -mm -mm. I was going to commit suicide. 
And, um, and the reason for that was the fact that no one talks about PTSD. Mm-hmm. And, and I was at a camp. And that's another thing. People was like, oh, it's no big deal. You was at a camp. You wasn't at a real jail and you wasn't at, no, it didn't have a fence. No, the guards wasn't running around with a gun. No, that didn't happen. But I can tell you, I got strangled. I got drugged on the floor. I got thrown in solitary confinement three or four times. I got chased around the compound like a baby deer as those racist guards laughed and thought it was the funniest thing on earth. And I've I've never experienced domestic violence before. Right. Right. But anyway, with the Khalif Broder, he, um, it showed in the documentary him being beat up by guards. It showed him being beat up by, you know, inmates, which I didn't have that problem. Um, But it, it showed this kid, this baby, being treated like that. And he was there for three years. Oh, my goodness. And um, he just, for three years, they kept saying, just say you did it, dude. Just say you did it. He was like, I, I can't. I want to go home, but I, I can't I can't lie on myself. And, I, and I'm like looking at this documentary alone in my apartment in Washington, D.C., thinking, that's my story. This, like, I, I had never heard of him before. And I'm like, right. that's my story. This little baby... This little guy, this is this is my story. Right. Wow. And when he came home, and when I came home, and I kept telling everybody, I'm fucked up, I'm fucked up. And everybody was just looking at the outer appearance of me. And everybody thought that I was the old Carmen. And mm-hmm. I wasn't. And I will no longer be that. Like, this injustice experience changed my whole life, my whole perspective. Right. Period. And um, I kept telling my family who lives in South Carolina, I kept saying, I I don't feel good. I don't, I can't handle this. I couldn't handle the re-entry. I couldn't handle me being a high achiever, me winning so many different awards and all kinds of, you know, things that I created that was just of integrity and and everyone loved me. And then I came home a felon. Yeah. With a scarlet letter on my back. And it might, it might, it might, it, it, it was like it was on my forehead. Yeah, indeed. And um, at the end of that documentary, I had no idea how it was going to end. Mm -hmm. And he had been home for two years and he hung himself over his bedroom window of his mother's house. And that's when I knew I had to get myself together because I did not want my family to be calling me and me not answering. And I'm up here by myself. Right. And they come here and I'm in here dead. Wow. That's how deep that pain runs. And most people that come home and and let is some of them think it's cute or a badge of honor, but it's a lot of people that come home that are fucked up. Yeah. Wow. Um, family, I put uh, the link in the chat um, so you can get to Sis Carmen's petition. Please, please, please go sign the petition. I did not know that about change.org taking the money. Yeah. I done set up and made a donation. You know I'm <laughs> pissed off, right? So what I'll need for you, um, sis, I'm not sure if you have a cash app or whatever, um, get with me to give oh me that, that yeah, information. It's on, website, it's on my website. Okay. On the, 
the Carmen story, or better yet, my nonprofit. We haven't talked about that yet. Yes, we're going to go to that next. If if you want a perfect, so family, I dropped the link to. Um, is it on the CarmenStory.org? Yeah. Okay. You have to, yeah. Make sure you cut and paste the whole HTTP. I sure did. P.S. Yeah. Yep. Forward yeah. slash colon uh, for, forward slash four. Sure did. So family, click that link and get to how you can donate to her directly. Don't do the change.org. Baby, I'm boiling. But that's okay. I cor correct that and, and make sure that it gets directly to you. So that's a great segue for you to talk about um, your organization. Yeah. And um, before we switch over to that, just just make sure they, they sign that petition and they put it on their social media platform yes. and to urge their friends and family members that are going through, getting ready to go through the system because, you know, we are a target, right. but they are instructed to not take a plea for something they did not do because only 2% do not or refuse to take a plea. And one and a half percent, well, 2% go to trial, one and a half percent lose that trial. And um, we get bust in the head. And the rumor is you end up with more time than, than the plea. Wow. Well, the, the last plea they offered me was for 10 and a half years. Yeah. On 24 counts of mortgage bank, wire fraud, conspiracy to commit uh, wire fraud or whatever that is and false information on a, a, a what do you call it loan application or whatever they said mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was women in there doing 10 12 15 years on one count so this don't even sound right 24 no no and I walked out of there in three years and some months wow so family yes make sure you sign the petition Make sure that you uh, put it on your social media. Now, we are talking an indigenous American Indian. Okay. Yeah. We got Indians all up in this chat. Yeah. Let's show up. Let's show out. Sign Sis's petition. Okay. Because your folks from South Kakalaki, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. South Kakalaki here too. <laughs> Show up and show out, family. I'm going to uh, make sure on this particular uh, show that I put the information in the description as well. Put the links in the description as well. Please go and sign the petition and share it on your uh, social media platforms. Um, before we get into your, um, your nonprofit organization, sis, mm -hmm. uh, someone in the uh, chat asked what's the name of that documentary that you were speaking on with with the um young uh, man do you it's remember Khalif Broder and it's on Netflix if I'm not mistaken okay Khalif Broder the backpack kid okay the backpack kid okay okay yeah. thanks so much yeah. okay so if you don't mind t tell us about your organization yeah, I'm so if you could see my face, that that made me smile. Um, it's, called, it's called Helping Ourselves to Transform. And um, when, when I came home, um, you know, I did have the benevolence to not do anything for a year and a half. You know, thank, you know, God for my, my family where I was able to not have to work or anything. But it's so many of our loved ones that come home from behind jails, prison camps, and cages from behind that wall, they have to go straight to, to work. Like, right. you know, two or three days, you got to go to work. And, um, you know, they send you to UPS or, you know, the post office, and there's nothing wrong with those jobs. But, I mean, I never worked that type of, you know, those type of jobs before. I come from corporate America. Right. And, um, and then, you know, right into my own businesses. So, you know, I wasn't ready for that. Exactly. You know? But um, 
after a year and a half and then going through the mental health aspect and, and um, suffering from chronic PTSD, and anxiety, um, I have extreme nightmares still. Um, after going through all of that, um, my sister, who's nine years younger than me, who um, lobbied to help get me out of that prison camp after she realized it was going to work. Um, she finally said to me, okay, you know, I know you, you, you're on your way back to the Supreme Court for the second time, but suppose it don't work, you know, you're going to have to have a plan B, you know, and, um, you know, we talked about starting this nonprofit because it was so difficult for me when I came home. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's so many reentry programs that are out here, but they're not doing what they say that they are doing or they're doing bullshit. Right. And for me, no one knew what to do with me. I mean, they had me in classes for drug addicts. That wasn't my issue. Right. They had me in classes for domestic violence from a spouse. Well, that wasn't my issue. Right. They had me in classes for like criminal thinking and remorsefulness for your victim. Well, I'm the corpus delecti. I'm right. the one that's injured. I'm the I'm the one that the fraud was perpetrated against. I'm the one that was hurt. Right. And so you know, that, you know, these organizations was like, well, you know, we can help you with uh, getting your ID. I'm like, well, here's my driver's license right here. Well, we can help you with getting your birth certificate. I have my birth certificate. Right. We can help you with getting your social security card. I got that. We can help you create a resume. Here is my resume right here. Oh, shit. She's overqualified. She can take my job. I right. <laughs> right. Whoa. Well, yeah, no one knew what to do with me. And everybody kept trying to stuff me in the same box with everyone else. And even to this day, what I, even though I'm in therapy, I'm in, I, I do, um, uh, I see a psychologist every Friday for the last three years. And I uh, speak to my psychiatrist once a month, just to be clear and honest and open and transparent. Mm -hmm. Um However, there I never was able to to be in. I needed to be in a group with other people who say they're innocent. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still haven't found that to be in the company of of what others that were falsely accused mm -hmm. of, of of things that was not true. Right. And, um, but anyway, moving along, my sister convinced me. And so we started helping ourselves to transform and we offer Paramount services. And a lot of the services that we offer, I do not have listed on the website. Okay. And there's a reason why I don't have a lot of the services listed. And one of the reasons is because um, what I'm realizing in this industry in this re-entry uh, container, people are cutthroat. Mm -hmm. These organizations are cutthroat and they steal and they lie and they- That do makes, that's things. very smart, very smart, sis. So what I will say, you know, the things that are on there are what, you know, other organizations offer, but I go even deeper because mm -hmm. one of the things that I am emphatically aware of, and that's one shoe don't fit all, number right. one. And number two, helping ourselves to transform is not going to turn anyone away. And mm -hmm. those were the same principles, guiding principles and moral compass uh, ethics that I used to create a million dollar company years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I turned around and created a nonprofit years ago with 500,000 in donations a year because okay. of the services and the fact that the people wanted to hear what I had to say. So in this container here in re-entry, 
each person that come home have a, a different set of issues. And it's very important that helping ourselves, helping ourselves to transform is able to meet each individual need and not put everyone in one box because that shit won't work. It didn't work for mm -hmm. me. It traumatized me even more. Wow. Wow. That, that is great. I, I mean, whew, what a testament from all that you've gone through to come out and in spite of still making a difference. So um, I just so honored you for that. Um, Thank you. You have to be one hell of a a woman, one sacred soul to have literally been through the belly of hell. Mm -hmm. And girl, I'm fenced to cuss. Hey. And come out of that shit yeah. and still say, this is what needs to be done. Yep. Despite all that I went through. I know what needs to be done. Yep. To help others. Yep. So just um just honor and and mad respect for that. Um high respect for that sis. Um So uh again family I dropped her link to um uh, the organization helping ourselves to transform. So yes. it's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash helping ourselves plural dot org forward slash. And I will also put this information um, in the description of this particular show. And um, are you taking donations for your organization as well, sis? That's the only thing I'm taking donations for. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So is it okay for me to say skip that change.org? Not the petition. Not, not the, the petition. petition. Sign not the, petition. the petition. Don't Sign. donate. Don't donate. Sign the petition and 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 pass the petition on to all your social media platforms. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you want to donate, um, make sure that you donate directly to the organization. So I'll put all of this in um, the description of, of this video. Thank you. Whew. No, thank you. Thank you. I, I mean that from the sincerity of my heart. No, thank you. Um. What what advice would you give your your younger self now? Um I guess one of the things in you know is to not throw your pearls to swine. Mm. And meaning that everyone is not worthy of your presence and everyone is not worthy of the gifts that you have to offer. And, and that's emphatical. You have to allow your intuition to lead you, whether to do business with this person or mate with that person or you know become friends with this person. Everyone is not worthy of your presence yeah. and that's the advice for all of us indeed and uh very very powerful advice um <clears throat> we kind of talk about that um and i've been talking about it a lot more frequently because of where we are um and i guess my my next question is what advice would you give young black girls that we all didn't come over here on uh, at the bottom of a boat. 
I'm that mm -hmm. uh, 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 most of us were already here and don't believe the hype that we all came here from the bottom of a boat. Wow. Okay. Have you found peace? I am peace. Wow. <sighs> okay. I lost the hurt. It no longer hurts. I'm no longer angry. But I am peace. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, how can we help you? What what can the family do to help you? To educate our children, our babies, our community on the importance of not taking a plea, of studying criminal law, um, understanding that most of these attorneys a turn your ass in and they just want your money. And I only know of three great attorneys and I never met them. Wow. And that was Johnny Cochran, uh, Kim Kardashian's uh, daddy. And the attorney, I don't know what his name is, um, who represented Professor Angela Davis in what, 1970 something when they said she killed mm -hmm. those cops or something. Right. Okay. Any other, I, I don't know any other ones. And if, if there are some good ones out there, please, you know, contact me. You can go right to my website, helping ourselves to transform and send me an email. Um, but as of what I see and what I went through, I went through four different high profile attorneys. Wow. I spent over 300,000 in paid legal fees now. And um, they all were crooks. Wow. And if I had a, a billion dollars I would, instead of going to the moon or wherever uh, Bezo went or uh, and pretend like he went, I would be creating an army of law students that will have a moral compass and, and, and have a conscience and have integrity and will see the disparity that black, brown, and tan people go through in this injustice system. Indeed, indeed. So family again, um, and I, I'm gonna put all of this information in the description of this video. Um, Sis Carmen's, uh, you can get um, overview of her story. You can get to the petition at uh, Carmen's, plural, story.org. And then to get to her nonprofit organization, helping ourselves, plural, dot org. Uh, so please, 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 indigenous Indians, stand up, go sign the petition, Share the petition on your social media platforms as well. Um, and, you know, check out her nonprofit organization. Um, I know a lot of us have family members who have either been through the criminal justice system, who are currently going through the criminal justice system, uh, so we can identify with the legal system in the Americas. And um, check out her organization. The website is helpingourselvesplural.org. Um, so, whew, 
sis, this, mm, I, I, I'm speechless. Um, I just want to thank you so much. I'm so honored. Um, this was a difficult one for me. Um, cause like I said, you, you've been through hell. This was the Disney version. You had, whew. This yeah. was the Disney version. Trust me when I tell you that. It's really unfortunate what our people go through. Yeah. So, um, you know that um, you're always welcome here. I'm sorry. I, I'm struggling and stuttering because I'm trying not to break down. <clears throat> you know, you're always welcome here. Um, you have an open door with uh, the family. So anything you want to come and talk about, um, please don't feel shy. Um, we're here for you. Um, we're here to support you. And when your book comes out, definitely um, we're going to promote your book. And um, if you don't get too busy or whatever, if you can check back in with us so we can chop it up about your book, um, you know, anything that you all are promoting with your organization, uh, we're here for you as well. Just anything in general. Um, I definitely consider you uh, a part of the family and um, I truly mean that from, from the bottom of my soul. So. Um, it's totally up to you, sis. Uh, I know you said, girl, you've been up since five something this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so we can end the interview now um, or I can open up the, the q and it's, it's totally it's totally up to you. I, I'm open. I can take some questions. I, I, I love questions. OK, so while I'm putting the um, the number in the chat. Uh, my co-host, and um, I do have three co-hosts, um, Brother Sean, uh, Sis Sandra, and then my adopted son, Scotty. He's he's a young and he's so precious. Uh, they sit on the panel with me. So um, if you all have any questions for Sis Carmen while I put out the call-in number for the family, um, that'll that'll be great. Any questions, comments, uh, what, uh, et cetera. So. I just like to say that um, the just us, just us, is the system that we deal with. It's just us. And I'm talking about them. It has nothing to do with how we are. And um, it, my heart hurts when I hear that justice system doing our people so violently wrong. It's not even just wrong, it's violently wrong. Mm -hmm. And my son and I realize that the minute you sign a document, when you, you check in, to the court, the Dell house, that's when they got you. You'd never sign any of their documents. Never, ever. Because that's when they attach your bond. But, but that's hindsight is not going to help the problem go forward. The problem going forward is our people need to wake up to what this system really is. And being in middle class and upper class, people don't realize how bad the system really is. I live in California, doctor, and I used to live in Los Angeles. And so they, they always handled us like animals, like we had no rights, and they'll beat us in whatever they wanted to do. And there was a, a precinct, uh, I think it was called the 77th Precinct, and that was in Los Angeles. You didn't even get out of the precinct. They killed you and say mm. suicide. So <sighs> I'm at a loss on how to, you know, get our people to understand the 
problems that this system has been for us. And we keep thinking that it's you're going to take care of us. You're going to do good for us. You're going to you're going to help us out. But that's not what really happened. It's not what really happened at all. What you did was you touched their money. Yeah. You hit their money, and that's all what they're about is the money. They don't care about the person who did it. They just want you to get out of their pocket. That the diversity of the note on the house went to their investors. And when you want when you want that ink mark paper, they can't give it to you because they didn't got rid of it. So that's the sweat ink paper they can't give it to you. But you know, I've had people who did, was charged with committing murders and the Three, three letter agencies are known to have set up people and they're supposed to be the justice system. But they set up people and they're the ones I heard is doing the crimes. We're just in a, in a pit of people who don't understand who we are as a people. And maybe they do. Because if you look at the three letter system people, the F and the C, they part of the Nazi group that came over here from Germany. So their goal is to exterminate our people and to torment us and put us in stress. That's their goal. And hopefully, I believe that we're going to overcome this system when we support each other mm -hmm. and we understand the system as it is, because understanding makes change because you don't want to get yourself in their system. I used to tell my sons that all the time, but they kind of hard hit me when they start a little bit. But um, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, thank you. I just, my heart sympathizes, empathizes, and it hurts for what you had to go through. And I have a relative whose brother was convicted of, of a neighbor and they conveniently lost all the DNA evidence for him and they executed him for that murder and found out later that he did not do it. So this is how they treat us. How can they just conveniently leave, leave balloons and misplace all the evidence but you know and i had to cry with her a lot over that and i'm just at a loss that we still in this day and age have this kind of system going on and then they say our people are black and we don't treat them like that we don't this and we don't that i said you need to learn your history and learn what you're all about before you can come there and say we don't treat them people like that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't know what life really is in the system for our people. And so when they say those kind of things, I just shake my head and say, truth is going to come out. All truth will be revealed. And they won't be able to hide behind their, their stocks and their bonds and their money because there, there's a repercussion in the universe that they will pay. They will pay. And I look forward to that. I look forward to them getting back what they put out. Because if you get, give good, you get good. But, mm -mm. Oh, right. boy. Thanks. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I went off. But no, <laughs> you're fine, sis. Thanks, sis Sandra. I just want to... um. Right quick, um, and I, I see you, Nisi Poo. I'm going to bring you on um, as well. I want to give the family, Sis Carmen, when is your book being released? I think you said September? Yeah, September. Okay, and the name of the book will be The Pretense of Justice by Dr. Carmen Johnson. Um, <laughs> the Pretense of Justice. Right. Right. Uh, so 
you know, we will definitely keep you all in the loop family as um, the book is being debuted. Um, and we're definitely um, going to pick up a copy. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to pick up several copies and um, give away some as well. And we will be discussing the book. Um, and hopefully, Sis Carmen will come back and uh, chop it up with us. Um, so, with that said, before uh, Nisi Poo come on, Son Scotty, did you have anything? Uh, and I haven't forgotten about anybody that wants to ask uh, Dr. Carmen questions. I put, I pinned the number. Let me read out the number. Yeah. Uh, the number, the call in number, you can do uh, one, one, 312 312. 626-6799. Um, I also pin uh, actually a couple call-in numbers, y'all. This is Zoom. You know how they rock if you have a question uh, for Dr. Carmen. So, Son Scotty, uh, before I bring on Nisi Poo, did you have any questions for Sis Carmen? Do I have any questions? No, I was asking... Uh, Scotty, oh, everybody got unmuted. Doggone it. Hold <laughs> on. Okay. All right. You you can unmute yourself. If not, I'm moving on. Okay, okay, there you are. I'm unmuted. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Um, no, I just I just want to say thank you for, for sharing that information and, and, and that story because... Um, you know, one thing for me, like being of my demographic, we don't really hear, you know, of other, like the elders going through stuff like this. Yeah. And then, you know, and then you would also think that, you know, you would have more support because it's like, if the younger generation is going through this and it's just so hard and PTSD and, you know, not having the support to rehabilitate after you come out, like, how much harder is it for someone, you know, older than us and, 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 and having that support? So it was just like very much heartbreaking to hear that. Like I'm thinking of like, you know, like my aunt or my mom or somebody, I'm like, yo, that's, that's, that's just like, it was just so, so heartbreaking. So, um, yeah. And then the advice that you gave about, you know, not, like uh, uh, the throwing your pearls to swine. That's like mm -hmm. literally uh, like a phrase my grandmother used. Mm -hmm. and, it reminded me of Big Mama instantly when she said that. And, you know, I, I, that is, it, it goes a long way. That, that, that wisdom goes a long way for every type of, like you said, it's not just with your business affairs, with your, personal relationships, your careers, you gotta, you, you gotta know your worth and you gotta deal with people who recognize your worth as well. That's right. So I uh, thank you so very much for your time and your story. Thank you. I appreciate you. And, um, just, just to add on there. Okay, brother Sean, I'm, I'm about to unmute you again. I don't know why you can't unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself now, I guess, just to kind of add on. It doesn't have me muted. <clears throat> oh, and you still show. I can hear you now. We can hear you now. Right. Okay. Ciao. You know how they roll sometimes. <laughs> um, just to put a little bit more on what son Scotty was saying. It, thank you so much, sis Carmen, for keeping it candid and honest about all who were involved in this fraudulent shit that you went through. Because when you said the judge went to Morehouse, baby, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. When you talked about the NAACP literally mm -hmm. turning their back. Yeah. Obama. 
it's important for us as melanated people slash black people, however you want to identify yourself with it. And we talk about this every week on this show. You got to use discernment. Mm -hmm. You got to start looking at shit for what it is and looking at people for whom they are. Mm -hmm. All skin folk ain't kin folk. Mm -hmm. We are talking literally your life depends on it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being honest on that. That should be a huge wake up call. Because I get on here and talk about it every week. And I know a lot of folks think I'm just being negative and blowing smoke. No. It's time for us to wake up and look, be adults spiritually and look at the shit for what it is. And we have to start cleaning, cleaning house and aligning ourselves with folks that have our best interests at heart. Okay, so with that said, um, again, family, if you have questions for Sis Carmen, the number is in the um, chat. And I also pinned it up at the top. Nisi Poo, I'm coming to you. Brother Sean, do you have any questions for or comments for Sis Carmen? On its empowered sense, we love you first and foremost. Thank you. What did you, my brother, how have you grown spiritually from this experience? I, I, I just love everybody. You know, my love for my people have grown even more. And that's, that's, that's the only way that I can I I explain it is just my love for my people has grown even more. And, um, and with that said, is 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 very important for me to save as many people as possible that are on their way behind the wall, or still behind the wall, or trying to come from behind that wall. And um, and with the tools and the the understanding or overstanding that I have from this injustice system, it has given me a even stronger gift to be able to uh, understand how to save more lives than I did with the housing crisis or credit situation. This right here, I'm getting ready to save a lot of people's lives that don't deserve to be in uh, this injustice system. And, um, you know, we're starting off with trying to uh, dismantle some of those nine crime act bills that are keeping a wave of mass incarceration on our people and uh, the revolving door of making our people um, into slaves. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to start with that 1994 Crime Act bill. And not to mention six out of those nine bills, our president of the United States wrote, co-wrote, or sponsored. Sure, sure did. With Clinton. Yeah. So my love has grown. Indeed. Wow. Okay, so uh, 
Oh, you good, Brother Sean? Okay, um, so I'm going to bring on Nisi Poo, she who walks among the mist. Uh, so let me unmute you. Halito, Osio, <laughs> Grand Rising family. <laughs> Peace and love, Nisi Poo. I just, I just want to say thank you, Auntie Rhonda, um, and Auntie Carmen, I got to call you my auntie, my big <laughs> sis. You are such a motivation, inspiration. And I'm trying not to cry because I'm Girl, such an impact. Don't do it. Don't do it, Nan. Don't come up in here. I, I've been struggling okay, all laugh. night. Uh, you got to say a cuss word now, auntie, so I can laugh. Now go on now, goddammit. Go on. <laughs> but you... <laughs> But I just want to say, I just, I appreciate you sharing your story because a lot of people suffer in silence and they don't share um, their story. Uh, maybe they're embarrassed or maybe they feel like, you know, whatever the reason, but the fact that you, you're a warrior and you share your story with people, uh, you are giving me hope and giving me inspiration and confidence. Uh, to do what I have to do for my for my son, um, you know, like when you were telling the part about your little sister, and she was saying, "Well, that's not going to work," and I didn't want to be in that situation where my son is, you know, reaching out and it's like, you know, the ideas he has, and I'm thinking, "Well, I don't know if that's going to work." Well, damn it, we're going to try it. We're going to do everything and anything <laughs> at this point because the system will will get these children very young and they don't know, you know, fresh 18 years old, they don't know what's going on. Right. They're just thinking that they're going along with whatever their attorney is going to tell them. And their attorney is, doesn't even have their best interest in mind. They're just, you know, on to the next number, um, yeah. sifting them in and, and, and putting them through the system. They're not fighting for them. And so you're out here fighting for them. And I just want to say on behalf of all of the ones that you're going to help, the ones that you've helped, and, you know, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. And it's an honor to be amongst the mist <laughs> and in y'all's presence. Um, and it was such a pleasure to find the connection. I was like, wait a minute. Dr. Carmen sounds like Auntie Rhonda. And she kept saying that. She kept saying that. And I'm like, and I looked over your information and I saw a couple interviews and I said, Nisi Poo, I don't want her to come on my platform and get her in more trouble, more situation. You know how I rock. You know I'm MF and SB and on a regular basis. And she kept insisting, you all are too much alike. And she made that connection. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, yes. And on the esoteric things and, you know, just a lot of the stuff that we've been learning with um, mindfulness, um, setting your intention, um, being the creator of your reality, um, practicing those things that, you know, we learn in the esoteric realm Um you know, with Bobby Hemming and some of the, the top scholars that, you know, we've been learning from. Uh, that's what this show is for me. It's like an, an expansion of a Bobby Hemmett, uh meeting. <laughs> 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 and so I know you will enjoy uh, the conversations that are had here and the things that, you know, the different stuff that Dr. Um, excuse me, that uh, Auntie Rhonda and Brother Sean and Sis Sandra talk about. I know you will love it. So you are at home here, Dr. Carmen, and I hope to see you in the chat sometimes building with us on Thursdays yeah. as we uh, sift through, uh, you know, religion and um, sci-fi movies and all the hidden mysteries and histories and her stories. And I'm just super happy to be, you know, with y'all tonight. So I'm going to yield. I love you, Dr. Carmen. I love you, Auntie Rhonda, Uncle Sean, and, and uh, Sister Rhonda. You guys are the bomb.com. Everybody in the chat, shout out to all of y'all. And uh, thanks for listening in. Thank you. Thank you. Love you too, Nisi Poo. Okay, I'll leave, your, <laughs> I'll leave your line open. You can uh, come back in. Okay, uh, Brother 832, I'm about to unmute you, brother. 
Uh, okay, brother, you should be able to unmute yourself. Roger! <laughs> Sandra! My sisters from other sisters! Feathers up! Feathers up, brother. United Snakes of America down! Sean, my brother from another mother sitting on Mount Olympus, throwing them black lightning bolts down tonight. Indeed, bro. And circling the cosmos, the solar system, and landing on the rings of Saturn. Scotty Youngblood, what up, though? What up, what up? <laughs> Dr. Carmen, my, I, I bow. I'm on bended knee. I cannot express the gratitude. Uh, it, it, it's, un, it's unspeakable. You know, when you bring up the examples of Khalif Browder, uh, this former administration using, what's, what's, what's his name, Alice Johnson? Yeah. You know, by mm -hmm. professing to release her mm -hmm. from prison. Yeah. The, the most recent stories that you've seen of, of in the, I think in one state alone in Missouri, and this shows you the criminality of the white supremacist system. Mm -hmm. The state's attorney general, either the state's attorney general or the district attorney of, I can't remember which, whether it was St. Louis or whatever other major city in Missouri, that apologized. Now, Rhonda, one brother 43 years mm -hmm. and another one 26. Did you, any of y'all hear those recent stories? No. They I, I all innocently and wrongfully criminalized mm. and after the apology still in jail um, not formally released and i believe you were i don't know if you mentioned it but you know um, everyone's familiar with either the innocence project mm -hmm. or our good brother with the montgomery museum the equal justice initiative uh my sister <clears throat> Signing the petition and sending you money is not enough. That's the minimum. That must be done. I mean, if I get that out of the way, those who are listening, that's not even something that should even be a discussion. If I have to, you've already set yourself aside and apart. It's not about my condemning any individual or any of the group. You are a collaborator and an agent of the white supremacist system. Period. In the paragraph. I don't care how you rationalize it. I don't care what conclusion you come to. I got to go to work. I got to pay my bills. I got to send my chillings to school. You know, these are all rationalizations to continue the existence of the white supremacist system. Hmm. So victimize people like yourself. And I, I hate using that term too, doctor, because that's, that's depleting you. Mm -hmm. That's disrespecting you. You know, we... There was an attempt to not just dehumanize you, was to eradicate you. Now, I, I want some clarity. I heard what you said, but I want some clarity on it. You weren't in the midst of the 2007, 2008, but this is the wake of the financial. Uh, you've seen the movie Big Short and uh, about the credit swap, credit default swaps. That's and what I was trying to think of. And how, mm -hmm. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. And, and that's why I'm, I'm trying. Well, that's part of why I'm bringing it forward, Rhonda, because again, I mean, I just, I want to have clarity. I understand everything she said. She don't have to make proof to us right. that she is a, a member of our experience as the original inhabitants of this land being lied on, having it stolen from us, mm -hmm. calling us out of our name, right? African-American, Negro, colored, black, whatever. And at the end of the day, have to prove to the criminals they stole our shit. Mm. But I'm trying to understand what I heard you say about these so-called African Moors. I know that's what you want to say, Rhonda. Ciao. That set up a criminal enterprise mm -hmm. that was in the wake of the 2007, 2008. And I know you didn't get impacted until 2014, but is that where you draw a direct line, Dr. Carmen? From those credit default swaps, the, uh, what do they call those arms? Adjusted rate mortgages uh -huh. mm -hmm. and the uh, subprime lending that yeah. put our people in these situations. So, yeah. could you give me some little more clarity on that before I respond to what we should already know now, a decade later, as to how this criminal enterprise of mortgages, banks, and foreclosures 
have put us in something we should never be in because this is ours. Could you give me some clarity on that? I mean, I'm not sure what type of clarity that you want, it's, you know, like, are you, are you well, wanting- how, well, how were they, how were they in a sense manipulating you by trying to help people get out of a criminal contract they were put in? Because when I, the bits and pieces that I can understand that you were saying, you're helping somebody with a credit report. I don't get how you're charged with 24 incidents of that's, bank fraud, that's what wire transfer. To say. I mean, that's this is where I'm getting, you know, mm-hmm. confused. Point. confused. Right. That's my point. That's my point. It doesn't make sense. So if it doesn't make sense, then it's not right. And I suggest anybody uh, pull my transcripts or do whatever you need to do. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense. And then to get hit with 24 counts and and walk out of there in three years and some months. That, what that, I'm hearing you say, I can't, was it Shirley Peel Jackson? Are you familiar with her with the IRS situation? Uh, Rhonda, I think you've heard of her. Um, I think she was the a- IRS situation? Yeah, yeah. The, the sister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was the only one who went to jail when all the other white boys didn't on exposing the IRS, mm-hmm. the 16th Amendment. And we should not be paying taxes mm-hmm. because taxes is voluntary by policy, mm-hmm. by the way. And it's unconstitutional because it was never passed or never confirmed through uh, three-fourths of the states ratifying the 16th Amendment. But that's a, another conversation. But she, similarly, being the only black female, former IRS agent and auditor, she went to jail. Yeah. The white boys didn't. Oh. Now, I shouldn't be drawing a conclusion here, but... It, Sounds suspiciously similar for however many of these Africans there were. It sounds like some African Moors set up the enterprise, the criminal uh, uh, con- conspiracy. The charges were based on that, and they were dropped on your left. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this woman with the IRS did a similar thing. All she did was expose the facts of the actual public record, not only internal to the IRS, but the law itself is unfounded. And there were other supposedly high level white males who were administrators and in management said the same thing. A handful of them barely got probation. None of them went to prison. Right. But she did, I think, for the same three years like you did, my sister. So if you're not familiar with her, maybe you should kind of reach out to her. And it's a bonding thing I'm just suggesting. I know you need allies. There's no question about that. But it's a lot, you know, you got similarities and similar experiences. It's not something she had to convince you and you ain't got to convince her because you've both been victims of the white supremacist system is my point that I'm making. And so when I'm understanding what I'm hearing, these Africans set up a criminal enterprise around the subprime lending that brought the whole global economy to the cliff in 2007, 2008. Isn't that what we were told, Rhonda? Yes. Isn't that what we were told about the packages you said? Mm-hmm. The credit default swaps. Yep. The uh, derivatives. The derivatives. Yep. The, pack- the packaging of this shit for AIG. Yep. Country. Remember Countrywide. Mm-hmm. Yes, it Washington do. Washington Mutual. Yep. Do we, do we have to name drop again about who went to jail in that? Too big to fail. I don't remember anybody. I don't want to lie, fail. but I I you, don't remember. You want, you, you want, yeah, I, I'm about to tell you. I'm gonna remind you. Bernie Madoff. Yeah. But that didn't have nothing to do with one. the mortgage stuff, though. You are correct. Okay, madame, I just madame. didn't want to, to lie correct. upon somebody. I'm, okay. But in the documentary reveal, and by the way, he just died in jail. Okay. The only reason he went to jail because he got exposed from it. So, yes, you are correct. He may not have had any direct connection to the cause and effect of the financial scam. But he is the only one who went to jail in the wake of it. You see what I'm saying? Six years later, she goes. I'm I'm not saying she's alone. We don't know the other stories. I'm quite sure there's another Negro Boule fraternity judge that sent some of us up to the big house. Isn't they call it? Up the river? Right. To the pokey? Right. Breaking rocks? I believe I heard that sister say she was in the chain gang. That's what I heard described. Now, she may not have broke rock. She may not have put, been put out there like Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis and Defiant One, you know, or our good brother, uh, what's his name? Remember Life with Eddie Murphy? 
Yeah. <laughs> Martin Lawrence. You know? But that was supposed to be a movie and a joke, right? Hmm. Khalif Browder is not a joke. Right. There's two brothers in Missouri, one 46, 43 years, the other 26 years. That's not a joke. That's today. It's not history. This right. isn't critical race theory. This is a 1619 project. This is the current white supremacist system that needs to use black women like this good sister and black boys like Khalif Browder to chew them up, to spit them out, and teach who a lesson, Rhonda. Hmm. You aboriginal niggas better not be coming up in here saying nothing about this is your shit. There is another woman, I don't know if it was she who walks in the mist or one of the other clan mothers or queen mothers that share with me that's going around trying to initiate a campaign, Rhonda, and mm -hmm. this is going to come across your radar, to prevent us from calling ourselves aboriginal. Yeah. Yeah, right. How dare they? Okay. But that's the arrogance of white supremacy. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, they've been set up in operation by African Moors who claim in the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, right? Mm -hmm. By pale-skinned Europeans claiming the charter of Magna Carta, Manifest Destiny, and Dumb Diversus. they all in agreement. We've talked about this retail cost fight every week. Yep. They are the conspiracy in agreement to target who and do what. And we still ain't got a clue. Right. So, Dr. Carmen, you know, forgive me for pontificating, standing on the sofa. You're in, like Tamika said, you're at home, you're a family, we cover you, we try to bless and pray for you. But I'll say it kindly and peacefully, as I say every week, I don't give a damn where you come from. I don't care who you are or where you travel across the cosmos of the universe. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get the hell up out of here. And I you. All right. Thank you, Brother 832. Thank you so much. Um, in the chat, uh, Magneto said, uh, thank y'all sisters. I did 15 years on a 20 year bid fight for us. And um, he said he's in Richmond, Virginia. So um, sorry about that, Magneto. Um, so I'm not going to uh, hold you, Sis Carmen. Did you have any last words you want to share with the family? Um, no, except the fact that, you know, if there are any law students that are out there that are listening that want to volunteer with me and be a part of this uh, dismantlement uh, of uh, these Crime Act bills, um, certainly uh, go to my website, send me an email, call me, um, anyone that want to volunteer. Right now we're working virtually. Um, that uh, have a paralegal background but refuse to take the bar. <laughs> you know, I would love to 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 work with with you all. Uh, any attorneys that no that's no longer part of the bar that want to uh, give back to the the community on the injustices that's happening in our uh, black, brown, and tan communities, and want to to help fight. Uh, alongside me, please contact me. Okay. And I appreciate all of you. And uh, Sister Rhonda, I love you dearly. I love and, you, sis. And Miss Walker, um, I'm expecting your phone call tomorrow so <laughs> we get uh, your son's attorney on a Zoom call as quickly as possible. And that's what my ask is. Okay. And, and you guys have a nice evening and I love you all and I send you all peace, love and freedom. Love you too very much sis Carmen. I'm sending you kisses and hugs and um, you have a home here uh, anytime. You're welcome here anytime. 
family, go sign the petition. Go sign the petition. Share it on the social media platforms uh, for Sis Carmen, our indigenous American Indian. So yeah. love you much, sis. I'm not going to hold you, girl. Go on and get you some sleep. And right, um, Okay, hit me up when you get rested up. All right. Have okay. a good day. Have okay. a good night. Okay, Bye -bye. you too. Love you, sis. <laughs> Woo. All right, family. Ciao. If you want to slap somebody, don't that that was rough, y'all. That was rough. Um, but all honor and respect um to sis Carmen. Um, I'm gonna put her information again. I'm gonna update uh, everything in the YouTube description. Uh, American Indians, let's show up and show 